Welcome everyone uh, to this first cloud debate on the fourth industrial revolution hosted here at the University of Johannesburg. Tonight we're going to talk about uh, two other sort of overarching aspects of the fourth industrial revolution and that is man versus machine. This idea of what happens to humanity with this, in this rapidly or fast evolving technological uh, environment. And uh, with me, I have a panel of experts that I'm going to introduce to you shortly. And of course, what we're going to do is not only discuss it with the panel tonight, we're going to channel questions from all of you, wherever you tune in from, whether you're uh, at the office or you may be in the car on your way home or you're sitting at home. But we hope to feed some of your questions as well to, to the panelists that we have with us here tonight. And we look forward to doing so. First. My name is Ilva Rodnigomerde and I'm a <coughs> professor of journalism here at UJ. And as I said, I have an excellent panel of experts with me here tonight. And to my immediate right, uh, I have a colleague here at UJ, uh, Professor Babu Poor, who is the serving uh, director of the Institute for Intelligence Systems here at UJ. A very, very warm welcome to you. It's Thank lovely you. to have you here. Thank you. And right next to uh, Professor Paul, we have Dr. Oscar van Heerden, who is the Senior um, Executive Director of Internationalization here at UJ, so also a colleague, and uh, someone who writes in the media as well on issues around the Fourth Industrial uh, Revolution. So lovely to have you with us. Thank you. And uh, right next to uh, Dr. van Heerden, we have um, Kamal Ramasin, who is one of our first industry experts to be with us here tonight. And Kamal is, as he says himself, a uh, self-confessed um, life servant of technology and, and ICTs. I think that's, that's really, really interesting with more than three decades of expertise in the area as well. So we're absolutely pleased to have you with us, Kamal. A warm welcome to you as well. And uh, right next to Kamal, we have uh, Bongani Sitole, who is a technologist, blogger, entrepreneur, uh, with an interest in blockchain technologies, the Internet of Things, and artificial intelligence, with long experience in this field as well. So, a warm welcome to you, Bongani. Lovely Thank to you. have you here. Thank you. And right next to Bongani, we have Dr. Nicola Taylor, who is also a colleague because you are a UJ alumni. But right now, you are uh, the director of JBR um, uh, Psychometrics. But as I said, you're also an alumni by the fact that you are a research associate with the Department of Industrial uh, Psychology and People Management here at the university. So a warm welcome to you, uh, Nicola. It's lovely to, to have you here. Thank you. And last but not least, at the right at the end of the table, we have um, uh, Toby uh, Shapshek, who is a media expert and the editor-in-chief of the magazine Stuff. And he is also a co columnist, um, uh, among other things, for Financial Mail. He's done a couple of TED Talks and talks and writes on technology, often from very interesting and provocative <laughs> perspectives. So it's lovely to have you with us, uh, Thank Toby. You very much. A warm welcome to you. I thought you were going to say interesting places like Johannesburg. <laughs> yes, that as well, that as well. And, and of course, I mean, big cities are, are full of technology and, and uh, smart technologies that are rapidly evolving. So we might launch into that uh, as well. Uh, and I think that that's important, actually, and we, we might, as I say, uh, come there. And I think, first though, and I'd like to turn to, to you, uh, Babu, and ask you a question around, there are a lot of fears, I think, around the fourth industrial revolution. I think that people are fearful of technological change, what's going to happen, and ideas around, you know, technology and, and man versus machine, and what's going to happen to humanity, uh, technology is going to take over, uh, jobs, are they going to be lost, for example? So, uh, what are your takes on that? No, thank you, Elva. Uh, actually, uh, we generally see the fear change. Means, on our way to the office in the morning, if we don't get traffic, then we will fear that what has happened. Uh, is there something wrong? Uh, now, we need to see a bit of uh, in the history also. Now, if you look at the first industrial revolution, uh, there was a huge fear when the first industrial revolution was happening, when the steam engine was coming in, when the, um, our uh, handlooms were becoming steam powered, huh? uh, and there was a huge fear of job loss, and there was job loss, there is no doubt in it. Uh, and, uh, and we landed uh, with the Luddite protest. Uh, similarly, with the second industrial revolution also, 
uh, we had up here uh, that uh, uh, automation and uh, will take over and electricity was invented then. <coughs> electricity, uh, some people say, didn't be, become popular even in the initial phase. Uh, uh, and in the third also, if you see, look at the third industrial revolution, uh, when computer, because most of us are in that generation that uh, where we saw the third industrial revolution, 1970s, 1980s, uh, the, when computer was coming in, uh, we, we had a fear that computer will take our jobs. Uh, the, we will not require anything. Maybe we will go to a ticket counter and the computer will give me the ticket and there was no need for any person to be there. But uh, similarly, the same thing is happening uh, in the fourth industrial revolution also. And that is uh, a fear that uh, jobs will be lost. Uh, and there were ripple effects after the uh, previous three industrial revolutions, and it subsided. Uh, and similarly, uh, to my understanding, there will be ripple effects all over the world after the fourth, means as the fourth industrial revolution progresses. But it depends on individual countries that how you manage it so that you can bring the ripples to a steady state uh, as fast as you can, depending on how you skill your labor force, how you accept it, how you embrace the fourth industrial revolution. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I mean, I think that's, that, that talks to some of the things of the, you know, the broader ideas around, you know, this, this rapidly, you know, um, uh, um, uh, development of technology and the uh, ubiquity of it. I don't know, uh, Kamal, this idea of, you know, rapid evolving platforms and the practicalities of it, what's happening? So, so I think the, the first point to, to support what's been said is technology has always created fear amongst uh, the user community or the intended users of the technology for the simplest of technologies, the introduction of personal computers, the, yeah. the, the integration of back office systems. Research shows time and time again that the biggest reason that technology investments fail is lack of acceptance of the change by people intended to use it. Mm. So, so this is, is a prevalent thing. I, I do think, though, in what we're dealing with with the, with the fourth industrial revolution, there's, there's, a, there's an additional level of fear. And, and this, actually, I've, I've seen resides not necessarily now in the, in the potential users of the technology, but in leadership of large organizations. Mm. Because the technology that we are, we are now dealing with, the technology uh, the pace at which we, we, we are, we are uh, evolving technology is, is exponential in the true sense. You know? Technology has historically been, been matured according to Moore's law. You know? The computing power matures every two years, etc., doubles every two years. Uh, and that's no longer applicable mm -hmm. with the technologies we're dealing with. So the leadership of large or small businesses, organizations, governments are grappling with how they adapt their leadership styles, their organizational structures, their strategies to be able to ingest this technology, to be able to derive value from it. And I, and I think when you combine those two fears, you're dealing with, uh, with uh, potential panic. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, unfounded in some cases, but it warrants levels of intervention that ordinarily wouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to, as much as we're going to prepare the recipients of technology, uh, we need to also prepare the current guardians of corporations to be able to harness the technology better. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's an additional layer of complexity we're dealing with. That. Mm -hmm. And what, what uh, Oscar, I'm going to turn to you. What happens with humanity in this, this space? Well, yeah, this is, this is my main, main issue, which is humanity 4.0. Mm. Um, you know, and I hear what the, the two previous uh, speakers are saying, but for me, the issue is, as human beings, our development has taken a particular trajectory over the centuries. Mm. Um, we are prone to dis destruction. Um, World War I, II, genocides, Holocaust, slavery, etc. And we are now in this fourth industrial revolution and the question that we must ask is exactly how are we as human beings going to use technology to try and offset some of those negatives? Um, and are we able to? Um, you know, we, we're looking at climate change, we, we're looking at very real socio-economic disparities within, for example, South Africa, and how will the fourth industrial revolution and machines in particular assist in poverty alleviation, inequality, and so on. Um, and so the role of the university in terms of research, what kind of agenda should we be pushing to try and address some of those concerns um, 
and not just a question of, you know, there's genuine questions around work, labor, um, and of course, the, will there be an increase in the haves and the have-nots? Those that know money, the Elon Musks of this world and so on, will be able to use technology much better than someone in Alex or in Soweto. Um, and what does that say about us as a human, as a, the human element within the fourth industrial revolution? And I think we need social scientists perhaps carve out our little niche to try and address some of those concerns. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll have reason to come back to that, and I want to take some of the questions that's come up as well from, from our audience. So we'll come back, and particularly this idea of socioeconomic developments and, and increased income gaps and, and also increased information gaps, maybe. Uh, but before we, uh, we go there, Toby, I want to turn to you. Uh, I mean, you write on technology, and you write a lot on, on technology from a perspective of how we use it. You know, so what, what do you see happening in this space? Well, I think an interesting way to understand the fourth industrial revolution, and we, we don't really know when it began, when it's truly going to take over, when the third revolution will be kaput. It's a bit of a, of a continuum of, of, of shifts between these different ways of, of doing things, of making things, of producing things, which is what industry is all about, isn't it? And what we're seeing is a continuation of the kind of automation that started at the beginning of the 19th hundreds where for the first time we started moving from an agrarian based society I mean at the beginning of the 1900 uh, nine out of ten people worked in agriculture of some form or other they lived in small villages uh, small towns big cities were starting to evolve commerce of, of, of the second re revolution as we know it was 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 picking up and now I think one out of ten people work in, in agriculture or agriculture related stuff. So, so artificial intelligence, robotics, automation, all of this is just an extension of that process that began. And obviously because we have silicon as a, as a, a key ingredient of, of the, the modern economy, the digitization, the computerization, the automation of all of these processes. I mean, I, I kind of read man versus machine, which is, you know, gay, you know good, good good uh, on a matter of care, but it's probably humanity versus algorithms. Um, and and Kip McKinsey came up with a, a, a big report last year, the great McKinsey report that had yes. nothing to do with ESCOM, um, <laughs> uh, in which they, they said that something like 800 million jobs are going to be threatened by automation of some kind or other by 2030. Now that's not far away. I mean, that's, that's 12 years away. Uh, mm -hmm. It's probably when my son will be a, a teenager and beginning to look at what kind of job he would want to do in the world. 800 million people is one-fifth of the global workforce. It's a very significant number. Uh, McKinsey also says that one-third of the global workforce in richer countries like the USA and Canada, uh, Canada Germany, other parts of Europe, are going to re have to retrain themselves to do different jobs. So, uh, of these 800 million people, it's something like 800 occupations in 46 different countries. This is hugely significant. And, it's, yeah. and it's, the, the, I think the thing about this so-called fourth industrial revolution is the pace of change is significantly faster than any of the other transitions between previous uh, Revolution. generation evolutions or revolutions or changes of systems. I mean, I, a good example is when I started studying journalism in my first year, we had to learn to touch time, right? And we all learned on a typewriter, mm -hmm. you know. I had a Twitter exchange with the great William Gibson, the, the man who invented the phrase cyberspace, and he said he wrote the first of his great novels, Neuromance, on a typewriter, and I went, wow, and he went, it was the 80s. Yeah. They were, uh, oh, obviously, yes, you know, I learned to type on a, a, a typewriter. But in that first year of journalism, the only people who needed touch typing as, as an essential, you know, mission critical part of our career were journalists and secretaries. Mm. The only people who ever learned shorthand. Mm. I only learned about five symbols in shorthand. I was, mm. I was always frowned upon by the old court reporters. By the time I finished my degree four years later in the fourth year, everyone was learning to touch type in primary school. It had become such an essential part. Now, Will that be a skill my son will have to learn in, say, five or six years when he goes to, to primary school? I don't think so. Because the natural interface that we all use to communicate with each other, the primary interface that we communicate is voice. 
Yeah. And we're at the we're at the beginning of that bell curve, aren't we? The the, the hype cycle of it. Mm -hmm. Alexa is you know the, the, the Amazon's answer to to voice assistance, mm -hmm. and 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 those kinds of voice assistants are the very beginnings of how we will interface with artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Right now, you can ask Alexa for the news or the weather or you know, kind of mm -hmm. silly stuff. It's going to get more and more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. I was driving here dictating uh, text messages using Siri. You know, if I search for something using Google, I use Google Voice. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a natural and easy way. Why? Because it's faster than mm -hmm. a thumb okay. to yep. say something. I mean, if you, look at, if you look at what's happened with the mobile devices, mm -hmm. sure, we carry this incredibly sophisticated, powerful, smart device. But actually, using a thumb or one thumb to input words is a lot slower than ten fingers. It's actually a step back until you start using voice. And suddenly the voice accelerates the pace at which we can interact with the technology. I mean, I know I'm getting a little off the topic, but, but you know, I use a, I use a predictive t a keyboard called swap, which means you don't have to type the word C double O L. You just move your finger between the words and it predicts that and it guesses your next word. And, you know, the, the, the autocorrects are sometimes quite spectacular. <laughs> um, uh, there should be a website for that, things my mother said, things my mother texted. Um, but that's the kind of trajectory that I see with where we're going. People are terrified that they're going to lose their jobs. Yes, that is a very big threat. But also, it's an opportunity. A lot of yeah. studies say that technology has created more jobs than it's destroyed. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a whole range of of jobs that didn't exist five years ago, that yep. didn't exist ten years ago, you know, and and we are going to have to be smarter in how we do that. Prof, mm. I liked what you said about how change averse we are as a species. We mm. really are. We all mm. we are all resistant to change because you know it's the nature of our brains. Our brains learn to do something that's mm. mission critical for mm. our survival, and we carry on doing it even though the environment we live in isn't you know the felt outside Johannesburg 300,000 mm. years ago when humanity mm. started arriving on the scene, as it mm. were. Um, and we just have to learn to change with the pace that reflects the society mm. that we live in. Um, you know, when people say they can't do anything, I always remind them of how many people switched from a Blackberry to a touchscreen mm. phone, and, mm. and after the first month of pain, they survived. Mm. You know? yeah. I I'd like to hear your comments on that, Nicola, because, of course, as an industrial psychologist, what, you know, or, or I should say, in, in industrial psychology, I should say, rather, you know, you, you probably have a lot of thoughts, particularly around the, the job market, but also the changing job market and this idea of new jobs being created rather than. Um, so I would like to, to hear your thoughts on that. Absolutely. I, I think uh, both are correct. So there will be jobs that are lost or that, that no longer are relevant. I mean, we don't have milkmen anymore or mm. lamp lighters or my favorite knocker uppers uh, who used to, they were human alarm clocks. They used to go and knock on people's windows to wake them up. So uh, we don't have those, those, those jobs don't exist. They've been Wouldn't replaced. Wouldn't that just be great? <laughs> like, just stop for a second and think about that. Like someone in Joburg trying to knock on the window with an extension that gets past the electric fence. <laughs> <laughs> You have to have a sign, like one of those signs that says, doing a public service, not a burglar. You know? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, so, so those jobs are obsolete now. Uh, uh, and we've got, uh, as Toby said, we've got Uber drivers. They didn't exist five years ago. Yep. Uh, we've got uh, social media managers. Those didn't exist five years ago. Um, and, and a whole slew of new jobs that have been created by this wave of technology. Mm -hmm. So from a job market perspective, uh, or from any perspective actually, anywhere where there is change is opportunity. Uh, and it's people, uh, gives people the opportunity to find a new niche for themselves, to answer a new uh, need in, in industry, to solve problems that, ar that arise because of this. Um, and and uh, I don't think that people need to worry so much about the availability of jobs. I think what the, the fear is very much around my job uh, not, uh, not staying relevant. Um, and, and that's where a lot of the fear comes in. So to just talk a little bit about fear, um, part of why we fear change so much is because there's a potential loss of control. Uh, we don't know if we're going to be competent 
in this new uh, environment or the new way of working? Are we actually going to be able to do this? Um, uh, this fear of the unknown, um, some people thrive on it. Some people love it. Uh, change is really a motivator for people. They love to be innovative and creative and work in these very ambiguous environments. But a lot of people really struggle with that. Um, and, and with a massive pace of change, you get change fatigue. Mm. You think, is this actually going to make my life better or is it going to be worse? Mm. So, so a lot of things that really uh, create the fear that can be answered, um, that can be answered once you know what it looks like. But once, uh, if you don't know what the future looks like, um, there is reason to be afraid mm -hmm. because yes. uh, your, well, your brain says so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it actually registers this change as uh, an error. And that fear of the unknown being an error means that you put a lot of resources into trying to solve this problem that doesn't really have an answer. Yeah. Uh, and and it won't go away until you've resolved it. Yeah. Uh, so it takes up a lot of anxiety, worry. Um, but yeah. it doesn't necessarily have to be like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, and and let's, let's stay with that. Bongali, you're an entrepreneur. Yeah. So we talk about you know new jobs being created, for example, or new competencies. So what are those? potential new jobs, new competencies, how are we going to adapt then and, and what, do we, what competencies do we need? Um, yeah, look, it's a, it's a little bit difficult uh, to basically tell now what competen competencies we're going to need. Um, I think if you look at historically where humanity comes from, I think there's, there's kind of like three streams. Mm -hmm. So you, you look at governments, you look at corporates, you look at individuals. And I think Historically, people, to, set, to a certain extent, they had some sort of ways to maneuver into different directions because we, we actually had less, um, uh, you know, controlled environments. So, uh, you know, like, for example, someone decided, let's start education, let's start the finance department, let's start this, etc. And all those sorts of things obviously came with, um, you know, driving a certain agenda. And people decided that, you know, let's join a certain stream depending on what, what am I interested in. Yeah. So you find yourself as, as an accountant because of there's a stream that was created by someone whenever, right? You find yourself as a doctor, you find yourself as a lawyer. Yeah. So I think, I think part of the, the fear and the disruption, so to speak, that's going to come in, it's because of technology and AI, AI specifically um, seems to be bringing a lot of disruption in those spaces and dismantling all of these industries that we have created as human beings. Is it correct or is it correct? We'll see what the future looks like, right? So these are the jobs that we actually created as human beings previously. And now we want to create new industries using AI and technology to define what the new jobs are going to look like, right? Um, I mean, we can actually question that in the next 15 years, do we actually need an, need an accountant? We don't know, mm -hmm. right? So if you look at technologies like, um, you know, IBM Watson, right, which is able to collect a lot of cases across the world and come to a conclusion in a matter of minutes, mm -hmm. um, then you start to question yourself, what is the need for an attorney in the, in the near future, right? So the next question would be that what sort of um, education that we need to start gearing our, our kids towards in order for them to be competent, right? So, you know, the, the last question would be, um, what is compensation after all, right? So we created compensation on a basis that we've made an assumption that an accountant is more important than a person digging on the street, right? Because of uh, the number of years that you've gone to school and so on and so forth. Unless they're an ESCOM accountant. Well, <laughs> that's precisely. Yeah. So, so, so now what, what AI is, is, is basically doing is we can start to educate people based on their cognitive ability, right? Uh, you no longer need four years degrees, seven years uh, degrees in class because you've got this uh, technological uh, software that can actually assist you to learn at your own pace. Mm. And the question would be then how would compensation comes through? Mm. then the compensation would actually help people to say you'll be compensated based on your thinking capacity and your thinking level, right? Yes. Whatever that you contribute into humankind is how you'll be compensated. So these mundane jobs, we can actually uh, push them to, to a machine mm. to basically do them. So, so humanity will actually be, be paid for how much you can think. And I think to your point, 
um, we, we need to start asking ourselves, how competent are we going to be in the near future against the machine, yeah. right? And, and, and that will now bring a question of how do we then change uh, uh, you know, our education in order for us to assist future generation to be more of a thinking generation or rather thinking economy yes. as opposed to looking for jobs, mm. right? So um, the, 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 the near future and the jobs that we'll be uh, creating, we don't know what that will be, mm. but uh, the direction that we're going, it's pretty clear that we're actually going through, uh, well, rather towards a thinking economy. Mm. I'm going to let you in now, Oscar. I just want to uh, tap on to what you just said, Mongani, and I think that we had a question from, from our audience uh, online about what you know but what about human uh, sort of you know ingenuity and and fascination and i've i've often pointed that out in these kind of debates that you know can an artificial intelligence be created that is fascinated by the world around it you know true entrepreneurs i would say are, are people who are you know have a certain amount of ingenuity but also you know this idea of fascination um I don't know if you have a comment to that, Bongana, before I go turn to you, Oscar. Yeah, look. Uh, I think it was Nadia who had this question. Yeah, Sorry, I should acknowledge yeah, Nadia. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think we, we had a chat earlier on. I think uh, one of the things that is going to be a little bit challenging for the future, specifically for robotics, is that, um, you know, for, for a human to take, sort of for, for a machine to take an emotion form, mm. um, how, how, do you, how do you actually teach a machine to understand an African culture versus a Chinese culture, and sitting around the table, be able to put up a comment that is actually taking that into consideration. And that is one of the uh, abilities that humans have, which you can, you, which you can teach a machine to, to, you know, to have. Um, you know, the, it's, it's, it's going to be difficult for a machine to learn that. We're gonna get there, I don't know, right? But um, to, to answer your question, um, I, I don't know if we're going we're gonna to even ever get to that point where mm -hmm. a machine is able to, to be excited by, by an output, right? Yeah. But, but humans are always going to be like that because mm -hmm. of that's how we are created. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm able to leave South Africa and go to a different country and be able to adapt as quickly as possible, understand how the people live, mm -hmm. and still not forget that I'm a South African, right? Mm -hmm. And whenever I comment, my background obviously come into, um, come into play but I also realize that I'm in a different country and how I comment and how I bring my expertise to the country, I have to take all of that in consideration mm -hmm. and emotions into play. Will a robot get to that space? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Oscar? Well, I mean, just to comment on yeah. that, I think, I mean, not that I can speak for machines, but I do think machines are going to say that's irrelevant. Your, your identity and your yeah. cultural yeah. practice gets in the way of rationality and um, decision making. But I mean, that's, I just wanted to comment on the issue of fear because it seems a lot of my colleagues are talking of fear that is partly misplaced and, and, and should be interrogated. But there is also a fear, I mean, we are a long way off from singularity. Yeah. I think that is an important point to make. Yeah. We are a yeah. very, very long way off yeah. by any stage of imagination. Mm -hmm. But the fear, I think, that is also overarching is a fear that you have machines that are beginning to, it is not, it's, it's human beings that are not understanding. Mm. The technology of AI is developing at such a rapid pace mm. that even those that are in the industry are sometimes surprised with the speed with which it is happening. Yeah. You know, at the moment we still think that it's, and it is by and large about mm. us having to input data mm. in order for the machine to interpret, analyze, and come to a decision. Conclusion. But we already have Mm. Machines that are having huge computing capability, mm. much more than we can ever imagine. Mm. Um, our stock exchanges don't have 400, 500, 1,000 people with five different phones anymore. Mm. There's, if anything, 20 people. It's a very pristine environment, no shouting. Yeah. Mm. And the reason is because there are massive computers mm. that are actually moving billions of dollars and rands around, um, and we just defer to the machine. Yeah. We, we, obviously, the machine need, must make the right decision. Yeah. I'm sure if you, you've had your one or two experiences where you get money from the ATM um, and it's, it's uh, 200 grand short later in the day. And when you actually trace back your steps, very often the ATM gave you 200 grand short. 
but you just believe that it obviously gave you what you asked for. Mm-hmm. Because so we, don't, we, don't, <laughs> we don't stand there and count our money. We just quickly put it into our pocket. Um, but it is about deferring. <laughs> Sometimes it says no. <laughs> so so the, the self-learning aspect is what I'm saying is does create enormous fear. Mm. And the truth is that as, as Toby has indicated, that even in environments such as, for example, um, in the military environment, mm. often they, they are now deferring to machines to make critical decisions. Um, you know, and so there are there are those kinds of fears as well. Mm. Um, and aug- augmented realities. Yes. Abs- abs- absolutely. Come on, I'm going to let you. In. So first, just a quick question, and I know that there are a lot of lot of new terminology. Mm. So we mentioned singularity. We're we're way, we're we're a long way away from from singularity. Mm. Uh, please explain the concept of of singularity uh, to our audience. Anyone wants to to. Have a go at that, Kamal. Can I? Well, I, I think it's 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 the point at which, it's, you know, I, before I comment, I just want to say yeah. something. Yes, no, Oscar please spoke do. with absolute certainty. Yeah, and that worries me. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to be absolutely certain about when and what's going to happen yeah. is is a, is a challenge right now. Yeah. So, so I, I uh, this concept of singularity of when uh, when machines actually are no longer in our control. Mm. Uh, they, they're yes. clever enough. They're smart enough. Yeah. Them. Uh, that, that's the ultimate fear, mm. right? And, yes. and I know you want to talk about the moving industry and the fear that that's created and so mm. forth. And, uh, uh, are we are we a far away from that? Uh, I think the common common wisdom says yes, mm. uh, but I suppose common wisdom has been has been proven wrong mm. over the years, especially at the exponential rate of some of these technologies. Mm. Mm. Uh, but what what I was wanting to talk about was a link between. Uh, these 800 million job losses, uh, I think Jack Ma was uh, a really uh, captivating YouTube clip uh, about his take on, on the education system. And, and, and what, what stuck with me was we've actually been training people to be computers mm. all of these decades. We've been sitting in one of the best uh, education institutions in the country, but that's what we've been doing. We've been, we've been cramming them full of information and, and training them to extract that information at the right point in time. Mm and apply. And computers will kick our asses if that's all that we're going to do. So to Nadia's point, was it Nadia? Uh, I think it was Nadia who Nadia's talked point. about ingenuity for example. I, I think that is the secret sauce. Mm. Because for me, what the fourth industrial revolution represents uh, from mm. a humanity perspective is a phenomenal opportunity mm. to, to unleash that creative, innovative, ingenious potential that has been locked in most human mm. brains. I mean, We've got some trained mm. people here. They can talk about the percentage we use of our brain. That is a new era mm. where, where more and more of the tasks that we've been, uh, sometimes not by choice, mm. trained to do, uh, can be done by machines. Where uh, we should be applying ourselves to say, how do we radically mm. transform the education system at all levels, at mm. grassroots, tertiary, and, and, and executive levels, uh, uh, to empower people to untap this this creative ability which we have. Mm. Because we can now assume that machines will execute. Mm. And that's yes. always been our constraint, is, is how do we execute. Mm. And if we take that away, we should be able to, to, to deal with a lot more creative. Mm. No, I, I think that's really interesting. And I want to, to uh, let the audience in uh, online here as well. And I, I have a, uh, um, three questions that I'm going to try to cluster together and open up to, to the panel, which I talked to about I think uh, also talks to what you just said, uh, Kamal, in terms of you know how do we how do we make technology work then for us? Mm. And and, uh, and Paul talks to what happens to democratic governance. What can democratic governance be? Equally, then uh, Mike says uh, what happens. And, and um, I think it's Andrea firstly who said what you know. Well, how can this how can this help developing nations, for example? And Mike asks and poor communities. So how can we make uh, actually technology then work for democratic governance in the interest of, you know, working for, for poor communities and, and in the developing context, maybe. Is there a, um, yeah. Well, from a movie point of view, <laughs> if, we, if, we, if we believe Star Trek, you know, then food, and food shortages won't be a problem because we'll just ask them, the computer to give us a nice steak and a and a yeah. warm coffee, um, 
and it actually will not be the real thing. It will just be a tablet that gives you the sensation of having had a steak because the brain needs to just mm -hmm. have a chemical, a chemical message to, yep. to be satisfied. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm saying is that technology can, if cultivated properly, mm -hmm. assist with things like uh, GMO, food shortages, mm -hmm. uh, preservation of water, how to do it better. These are what technologies can mm -hmm. offer and bring to the, to the party. The problem mm -hmm. with that equation is that we've seen how Africa has always remained a captive market mm. for technology. Because the problem is that technology is not just given freely. Mm -hmm. Someone has to pay for it. Elon Musk is not going to send someone to the moon for free. Someone has to fork out some serious amount of dough. Um, and that is the problem mm -hmm. with the question around developing countries, mm. which is that we might develop these and, and yes, I agree with Toby, it's, mm. it's true that Africa as a, as, a, as a market now also has mobile technology, they've got smartphones and so on. And we know to empower the poorest of the poor, at least if they can have some kind of device with prepaid, um, it means they are connected, they can look for work and so on and so forth. So technology does bring that positive mm. element. Mm. The problem is that if we are going to continue with the world order within mm. a capitalist system where Silicon Valley types want to return on investment, mm. then unfortunately technology is not going to be assisting mm. the poor of the poor because mm. we simply won't be able to afford it. Mm. And this talks as well, I think, to ethics and leadership. And it's something that I like to always emphasize in these conversations is that actually we need to take charge, we need to have good leadership in these spaces, probably even on a global scale and on a global level to uh, reign, but then also to talk to how do we furnish ethics and what is, you know, what role does ethics play in good governance, uh, 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 for example. But I, I know Bongani and, and Nicola, yeah. you both, uh, Bongani, you want to say something? Yeah, yeah but I, I just wanted to basically add on um, what, what you were saying. I think that, that there's two things. One is that, you know, we, technology is starting to open up questions mm. um, around governance, because if you look at South Africa, we're studying to ask questions okay. about regulating Uber, Airbnb, and so on and so forth, right? Cool. But if you look at that, it's actually technology that is actually you know, generating money for the ordinary person on the street. Mm. Um, but we, we starting to question those things. So now mm. the, the next thing would be using you know, this term loosely disruption, yeah. is that the stuff that we're going to be seeing a lot more potentially is to give a lot more power to, to the ordinary person, right? To your point in terms of having access to internet, be able to apply for jobs and so on and so forth. But this is what I always say. The problem with humanity is we've got a tendency to basically mess up a good thing that is being mm -hmm. developed, right? And my closing remarks in that same sentence or, 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 or comment would be that if it was possible for humans to capture op mm -hmm. oxygen, mm -hmm. someone was going to do it and sell it. Mm -hmm. And the poor people were going to die, mm -hmm. right? So if you take that as an analogy, that's essentially what humans are doing. So you've got this new oxygen called AI, which is supposed to be actually giving people you know, betterment in terms of what they do. But again, coming to a Silicon Valley type of uh, structure, people are going to capture this and say, how, how can you capitalize on this? Mm -hmm. right? Instead of bringing back the power to the people, we're going to now enforce certain rules, certain laws, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we'll find ourselves in a situation where a gun was not actually created to kill a person. Right? But now we're using it to do that. So, so, so the question of technology is, we know that we're doing this for betterment of humanity, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, we're not using it to do that. And mm -hmm. that's, that's where the biggest fear and concern is coming from. Mm -hmm. Because if I, if I can build technology to capture oxygen, uh, I'm going to be a trillionaire. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. And uh, people will have to pay for it. Because mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's free things that you think about. There's water, which is supposed to be free to an extent. There's electricity or at least energy. Uh, the only thing that people are unable to capture is oxygen. Mm -hmm. And that's where the biggest problem is. Mm -hmm. And we, we see that we see that pollution and it's Pre in, increased fears all, all, all over the world. Pre precisely, mm. right? You you look in the the, the rising of the oceans. Mm. Uh, you know, in the next 50 years, 200 years, it's estimated that you know it'll go up by you know a meter, two meters, right? Which means that it's going to take up a lot of land, mm. right? And the people who are supposed to be taking those decisions to reduce the carbon emissions. Mm. 
they are not taking those decisions precisely because they are sitting there with the fear that if I actually make this decision to reduce the carbon emission, um, I'm going to lose the Fed check that I'm getting. So the idea around it is like, I'm not going to be here in the next 50 years. So they will sort it out. Um, and then, you know, let's, let's do what we do. I mean, if you look at what ESCOM is doing at the moment, they're providing 97% of energy in the country. They're using 2% of the clean water to basically clean coal. Mm. Right? So you're taking 2% of the entire country's water, which was supposed to be given to people for free, mm. you're cleaning coal. You don't want to sign an agreement for free independent uh, producers who can come up with alternative means to, to generate energy so that you can reduce that 2% to at least, you know, half a percent. Mm. You can take that 1.5% of clean water and give it to the ordinary people in the street. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, so, so that's, that's where the problem yeah. is, right? So we, we live in a capitalist world. And, and unfortunately, whether you look at technology to be solving problems, yes, it, it will do that. But the challenge is to what extent and what are new policies that we need to look at as a, as a, as a planet. Well, so, I think if you don't mind me yes, jumping no. in, I think, I think how that relates to this debate tonight is that so many decisions in the world are made on gut instinct and, yeah. and, mm. and not on data. And we live in a world where so much data is available for so many things that we do, for so much stuff. Like, mm. I didn't know it was a 2% two, two of the country's water. Yeah. Mm. You know, we, we live in a world where big data can inform better decisions, smart Precisely. decisions, mm. more effective decisions. Um, and, and, you know, if you, if, you, if you saw the movie Moneyball about American baseball players, it was a fascinating film starring Brad Pitt, I went to my red book, and, and what this guy who came up with this idea proposed is that the, the baseball scouts and the baseball coaches were looking at the wrong data. Mm. Yeah. They were looking at how well did he throw, how well did he run, actually that's irrelevant. How well did he hit the ball on X, Y, and Z, mm. in X, Y, and Z circumstances. And if you extrapolate that to the kind of decisions we make around um, healthcare or providing oh. water or electricity, you know, we're stuck in an, in an age where we think we need coal-fired solutions. We don't. Yeah. $42 billion a year is spent maintaining the electricity grid in Africa. Precisely. And we have 300 days of sunlight yep. every year. Mm. Yep. You know, why are we not exploring solar? Why? Because the kickbacks are bigger. Oh, you know, why does ESCOM build 300 billion rands worth of unnecessary debt into what it does? Because the kickbacks are bigger. Yep. Whereas solar is, you know, effectively free once you've paid off the, the startup costs, the, 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 the capex to get yep. the panels and the batteries mm. and everything else. Why does why do governments not pursue that? Well, because the kickbacks are bigger on other projects. That's precisely. So, so if we take. The available data, and we look at it in a different way, and the theme is, you know, creating tomorrow. Mm. What is the future going to look like? Well, mm. the future looks like uh, a very efficient way of, of, of doing what we've been doing without the heavy expenditure of, of, of the previous economy. Mm. There was a great line in The Economist I read years ago, just when the internet was kicking off, about, about 15 years ago, and, the, and, and at the time the internet was called the new economy. Yeah. The commerce wasn't didn't exist, internet banking didn't exist. And the line was, the best thing about the new economy is it's, it's going to make the old economy more efficient. And if we, we look at that now in terms of the new economy, what is the new economy? It's e-commerce, it's, yeah. it's, it's more efficient ways of doing things. May ne not necessarily be Amazon's model of doing things because Amazon has been able to build itself into the world's second one trillion dollar company by paying its staff very little. You know, and, 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 and its profit margins are much higher. I mean, they've got an increase this week of something like it was 15 or 20 cents an hour each, which is not particularly mm. significant. Yeah. But if you look at the new ways of doing business, I mean, it's so much more efficient. Well, sure it is, but it has major challenges for the old way of doing business, which employs more people. Okay, how do we retrain those people? How do we find other jobs for those people to do? Do we believe? The fear mongering that you know automation and AI will take our jobs. Do we believe the counter studies that say technology creates more jobs? Mm. Well, let's let's see the evidence of it. Mm. You know, let's let's try a little case study. Let's do a few things mm. here and there. I personally think that the gig economy is 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 a misnomer. You know, sure you're able to be your own boss and drive an Uber or a Lyft car whenever you want. But the problem is that previously you you 
you work for eight hours, but you've got a whole bunch of things as part of your job contract. You've got insurance, you've got a medical aid, you've got leave, you know, 21 days a year. Uh, you've got a whole bunch of things that came with it. You've got, you've got uh, <clears throat> the tools to do your job paid for by your employer. Mm -hmm. Now, in the gig economy, all of those things that were once a part of the package that you put in your eight hours for, you have to pay yourself, including insurance, uh, petrol, all of those mm. things. That's that's not necessarily a better thing. Mm. I, I speak to Uber drivers all the time. I don't think they have a better life. The New York Times and other American newspapers run features often about mm. how mm. these Uber drivers will sleep in their cars, drive mm. to a conference city like Austin mm. for South by Southwest, and work for 10 days straight, mm. sleeping in their car in car parks so that they can make a decent income. Mm. That's not making humanity a better place. Mm. Yep. It's making some people at the top of the pyramid a lot richer, mm. yeah. but it's not making humanity a better place, yeah. even if people are now their own bosses. Yeah. Now, I, 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 I hear you, and I want to turn to, to you, Babu, and ask about, I mean, but, but basically what this boils down to here is sort of a, the, the haves and have-nots. Eh? So who will, be, who will come out the winner in this game? Uh, okay, I'll come to that. Someone has asked about democracy, and uh, actually, technology has made democracy the most accountable. Because uh, if you see, uh, if you see the voting, uh, many countries do uh, the electronic voting machines. It is very difficult to tamper. Uh, the, the paper voting, uh, you, you can rig voting. Uh, now, uh, with technology, if you see, uh, if a leader does something wrong, it is already within minutes on the Facebook. So he becomes accountable. Uh, if blockchain becomes popular, uh, then uh, l uh, the transactions and everything will be recorded in the blocks. So you can pinpoint mm -hmm. that who is responsible for the fault. So basically, uh, democracy will become more accountable with, and it has become over the years, has become more accountable with the advancement of technology. Mm -hmm. The other thing that came up is poor communities. Mm. Technology in previously also has helped poor communities and in future also, to my understanding, will help poor communities. Because when mobile phone came into picture, before that, if mobile phone was not there mm. till date, then also we would not bring in the villages into the communication network with uh, the landline phones. Now, this mobile phone has shifted the total economy even, means bringing them into mainstream, the villages and the remote areas. Uh, so it wouldn't have been possible if mobile technology was not available. Now, uh, I was reading uh, the, the other day that you can build a house within 50,000 rands using 3D printer within 24 hours. Now, that is for the low-cost housing. Yeah, yeah for, for, for the... Uh, Mm, uh, financially backward. Uh, so that is why I feel that uh, uh, these are some of the things means. Uh, another thing that, uh, uh, for example, uh, with the help of big data, as Toby was saying, uh, we can manage disease. Uh, we can manage chronic diseases. Uh, the, and uh, we can give healthcare at a much lower cost. Mm -hmm. Means basically, uh, the, and this lower cost health healthcare can be delivered to the poor, and we can save money also using technology, artificial intelligence, uh, looking at the data. So these are some of the things. The other thing that you were asking was no, just who comes out on top in, in this? You know, so big, I think that let's stay with big data for a while. So okay. it's often said that you know whoever controls the big data will be the winner in this game, and 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 we will have. As, as you said, Bongani, you know, whoever can control the, the you know, oxygen <laughs> will be, you know, the, the, the new uh, zillionaires in, 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 in this game. Hey? So, so, Babu, if you would have a guess, who, who wins, you know? Uh, actually, who will be the powerful? Actually, uh, who is having creativity and who, and who is having knowledge, he will be the winner. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, if you see Facebook today, uh, the, the, a billion dollar company, uh, but it was the idea and the knowledge which led to it. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the tech companies was the idea. Basically, Uber that we were talking of, 
the shared economy that we are talking of. It is the idea and the knowledge to implement it. Uh, and another advantage of the, the, the knowledge-based economy is that in the first industrial revolution, to a certain extent, the second industrial revolution, it was not in that respect, high respect, knowledge-based. So it was basically dominated by men. Mm. Now, in knowledge-based kind of revolutions, like uh, the third one uh, with computers, <coughs> the fourth one with data, mm. women can equally take part. Mm. Because you don't need a huge amount of muscle power and manpower to push some big, huge machine. Or, mm. huh. So they can equally take part. To a certain extent, women are more creative. So they can uh, develop new things. So my feeling is that those who will be having the knowledge and those who will be having the creativity, they will be the winner. Mm. I'm not so, wanting yeah. to disagree over, but, yeah. but you know, the truth of the, the we already have examples where creativity and ideas have come from Africa, yeah. have come from the developing world, and it simply gets bought. Mm. You get bought out. I mean, uh, Mark Shuttleworth is an example. Mm. Um, okay, but he got bought out for half a billion dollars. Sure. <laughs> Um, but he's, he's just one person that, that benefited. Mm -hmm. yeah. just yeah. well, mm -hmm. Sorry, Toby, go ahead. But uh, you know, my only comment is the lack of a, a proper venture capital market in this country. It, doesn't, mm -hmm. it forces you out. Mm -hmm. I've been raising money for Every years. capital, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So that's one of the remedies. If you want to keep the, the innovation here, mm -hmm. then create a platform to fund it. Mm -hmm. Or they'll go where there is funding. Mm -hmm. so, so, uh, no, no. No, so, yeah. so, I, just, I just want to come out. I just want to make sure that we're on the same page with regards to your question around yeah. uh, who's who's going to be a winner. And I'm not sure if that question is is actually uh, relevant in a way in terms of who's going to win or not. Yeah. Um, and and the reason for that is because you know I'm 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 going to give you a simple example. So you you have an individual who wants to apply for a loan at the bank. Yes. The bank says, give me your data in order for me to be able to assess if I can give you a loan. The bank then goes to a credit bureau and says, uh, give me a score of this individual. Here's, here's a problem. As an individual, in order for me to get my credit score, I need to pay for that, for that report. I'm paying for the report for the data I provided to the bank. The bank needs to pay the credit provider for the data that they gave the credit provider, mm. right? So at the end of the day, the person who's losing in the ecosystem is an individual. Yeah. So now the question of who's supposed to be a winner should be if technology can allow an individual to own his own data and exposes that data to the person that he wants to expose it to, as opposed to organizations owning our data on our behalf and we buying the data back. Mm. You look at Facebook, it's a dollar, it's a, it's a you know, million dollar whatever company, okay. right? But what makes it to be, a, 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 to be at that state? It's people's data because of people are contributing, mm. right? So essentially, I'm actually the customer mm. when I'm in Facebook. I'm being sold by Facebook to organizations, right? Mm. And I'm not getting a cent of that transaction, mm. right? Similarly, in the same context that I've just said, why should I be paying a credit provider mm. for the data that I've provided to the credit, pro to, to the credit provider, and the credit provider mm. is actually taking my monthly installments, mm. taking that data, giving it to a credit provider. Uh, two, two years later, when I come back and say, I want to buy a house, I go back to them and say, I want to apply. Mm. They actually ask the credit provider for the data that they've provided. Mm. So who's actually a loser? It's an individual. So, Technologies like blockchain should then allow users to be able to own their own data in a private and public key manner, where if I want to do anything, people need to ask my identity and I can allow them to, to do that. And they need to pay me back. If you look at how people are making money from a Bitcoin perspective, it's like precisely that because I'm an individual, I'm actually making money on a basis that I'm approving transactions, right? I'm a miner. Why is it that in the technology doesn't allow people to become holders of data? Organizations need to pay me to ask for my data because of I want to transact, transact with them. So to ask a question of whether who's going to be a winner, 
if technology can bring us back to that basics of people owning their own data and organizations <laughs> There are options where you can not accept mm. until you have someone's cookie. Mm. Uh, and and that's, that's, a, that's a new era. Mm. How does that fit into how algorithms are going to make our life easier? Well, you know, we, we, we are able to track how people are tracking us mm. as, a, as a first departure. Uh, secondly, th the thing about algorithms is that there's a misconception that, that you know, if, if a bank manager does a credit check and they walk in and they see that, you know, the person is black, they're going to instantly have a, have a, have a, a feeling that they, they won't be able to pay or whatever prejudices they have. Yeah. Mm. Well, it turns out those kind of prejudices can be programmed into the older world yep. as well, yep. you know, as numerous very high profile cases That's have shown. True. Is the algorithm going to be any more neutral mm. than anyone else? Well, it depends on the data set. Yeah. It depends on the algorithm. Automation and better ways of doing things aren't necessarily more ethical ways of doing things. There aren't more equitable ways mm. of doing things. You know, the algorithm 60 years ago uh, in Europe would have completely uh, um, uh, disadvantaged me because I'm Jewish. Yeah. I, the mm. algorithm would have algorithm would have seen me in a different mm. way. Mm. It's it's the shifting cultural norms mm. that have an impact on, on, on automation. So we have to be careful of advocating a, a new world, not that anyone mm. in this panel is, based on, on the, the purity or the, mm. the, the ethical wholeness of a system, because the system is programmed by us. Yeah. And whoever mm. us is in that case, uh, we are we have our own prejudices, mm. you know. I, I think this is this is this is uh, really really important that we're getting to some of the nitty gritties here, and I think that one of the question uh, uh, questions that often comes up in this space is about lit new literacies, so digital literacy, for example. So how do we we we're very bad at protecting ourselves online, and and we've had actually questions from our audience online, and and uh, Mirenva asked about uh, what about cyber security, cyber attacks. Winnie talks about uh, what happens when computers or algorithms malfunction, yeah. you know, and how do we protect ourselves and, and what kind of literacies, digital literacies do we need? I don't know, Nicola, did you have, do you have any ideas around that? Um, you know, algorithms go bad. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, 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 yeah. Uh, well... Algorithms <laughs> breaking bad. Yeah. You see, like Walter White, you know. <laughs> Um, uh, um, so, look, uh, what you what you feed the algorithm is going to determine what what comes out, mm -hmm. um, and and I think part of the fear back to the fear again, uh, people is that these algorithms are going to take over and and uh, make all the decisions for us and, and so on, and particularly now we need to be really um, involved in auditing. Uh, where they go and, and, and mm. what happens. Forget about things <laughs> orders. We need an algorithm. The uh, algorithm strikes back. Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so I'm going to use an example in the right? So, uh, and, and this comes into uh, people say algorithms are going to remove bias completely from mm. the recruiting uh, process. And then he laughs because he knows. <laughs> um, and, and uh, you say, great, we're not going to take anything like race and gender into yeah. consideration. It's really only going to be around education. Mm. Uh, and and you, uh, 
everyone thinks this is wonderful. It's a completely unbiased algorithm. Mm. And, uh, and it ends up that you're still selecting uh, white Ivy League school um, mm. goers mm. who uh, who who fit a certain profile. Mm. Uh, and you go back and interrogate the algorithm and you say, well, the, the, how they're selecting these fantastic people whose mm. job is based on whether or not they played wood polo or lacrosse. Mm. Um, because that was the... Key or they want, or they, they want. Or mm. Mm. Exactly. Mm. So, so the, the, we have to make sure ethically that we still interrogate mm. the algorithm to make sure it isn't discriminating. Mm. Um, and um, and creating bias. I, mean, I, I feel like I have to come out in defense of the algorithm because what algorithms are really good at is picking up fraud, yeah. um, yeah. making decisions around who to give credit to without those kind of biases. I mean, there's some there's some very good examples of, mm. of how that's been done. You know, I mean, it's the algorithms are probably better at packing uh, a warehouse and knowing when to pack and how to do it. But but I, mm. I agree with you. I mean. It, it, Fundamental problem is what are the what is the input data? Who yeah. decides what's good at the mm. job? I mean, the, you know, the, the, the research is, has always been if you want to find someone who's really hardworking and is, and, and is determined to make a, a go of their life, find an immigrant. Mm. Why? Because they've made the effort to come to the country mm. to start a new life, to do something different. You know, and they, you know, that's that's definitely a, mm. a, a thing up and yet most recruiting practices would look mm. down that. Why? Because of prejudice. Mm -hmm. and, and also on a more practical level, there is language, accents, yeah. there's facial recognition. Yeah. These are all things that you still have to input the data. And depending on where the algorithm was developed, etc., mm -hmm. it has in, in, innate uh, uh, short, biases. short yeah, biases. I mean, let's look at what algorithms could do for fake news, which is very important yeah. to our industry. Yeah. Uh, turns out they're not that good. Why? Because the people who wrote the algorithm speak English. Yeah. You know, they don't speak the, the, whatever language is mm. being used to, to spread the face of to spread hate <laughs> speech in, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. in, in Myanmar, yeah. um, so for instance. The age-old yeah. technology acronym, garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. Garbage in, garbage out. And yeah. the, the bigger the computer, the faster so the process politics. goes. Yeah. <laughs> That's garbage in, garbage in. <laughs> and, and, and I think that this is this is maybe also the lesson learned, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad, Toby, that you based the journalism here, yeah. fake news, for example, as an example, because I think that, yes, actually, we, we, we turn here to algorithms as, you know, we want to make programming, and, and, and I know that uh, Google, Facebook, for example, are, are, are looking at this, how do we, can we, can we develop algorithms to, to detect fake news, for example? And at the same time, we know that that, that, might, that might not be possible, you know, but there are, you know, there are challenges in that space. And, I mean, and on the other hand, you know, this idea then of, of big data, so we're talking about big data as some, you know, dangerous in some spaces, but then also, of course, for journalism. I always say that journalists can actually, for, for once, go back to, you know, the very basics of, of getting out there on the street and talking to people, having conversations, and letting big data do other things, you know, but, well, but we well, still need someone to interpret the big data. Exactly. You know, mm. you've got data. Data is another source. Yes. You have to interrogate that source as you do any other source. You have to get a second opinion. You have to <coughs> verify it. You have to get a second source. Bloomberg's done a very interesting thing where they, they feed financial data in a spreadsheet into an algorithm and it writes a financial report and it writes it in three seconds. Mm. Yeah. You know, whereas a, you know, a journalist who drinks coffee and stands outside, smokes a cigarette, takes an hour, two hours. You know, so, so that's the kind of run-of-the-mill journalism mm. that can be automated and, and frees mm. up journalists to do more important things mm. like investigations or mm. thought pieces or, or mm. uh, more thoughtful, engaged writing. Mm. So, so kind of breaking news and financial news, that can be written by a computer. Mm. Mm. Not, you know, mm. That's also generally. another another aspect that is, yeah. that is under-investigated, I think, which is yeah. how technology has changed our behavior. Mm. I mean, like Toby, I've just recently come back from London, and it's absolutely astonishing that people just don't talk to each other anymore. Yeah. Whether you are in the underground, whether you are at the train station, 
we might as well be in a quiet zone because That's everyone's got right. everyone's got <laughs> earphones earphones in their ears and is very involved with the phone or mm. is just selecting music or somebody's watching a movie uh, but they are certainly not communicating mm. with each other. Yeah, if you have teenagers at home, you know exactly. Right? Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Teenagers are Londoners on the tube. Yeah, exactly, yes. Yeah. Teenagers are exactly like Londoners on the tube. Yes. So, so, so I, I think one, one of the problems with uh, algorithms is actually self-learning. Right? So because yeah. of these things are able to self-learn, you can control what they're learning. Mm -hmm. And you know, in some instances, you might not even know where the, the, this, this algorithm is at in terms of how much it has learned. Yeah. Because it has it was able to collect as much data as possible that the issue did not necessarily fit it into it. So I think one of the fears is basically to say that if robotics are actually self-learning to a point that they realize that actually the threat for me to continue is human, mm -hmm. then what? Because you, you're actually now giving a lot more data to these machines, mm -hmm. and then they realize that actually in order for us to make more money or to make better decisions, the blocker is human, so let's yeah. let's eradicate the problem, mm. right? So that we can move forward. What yes. what do you do, mm. right? No, think not human, Bogani. The, yeah. the problem is a is a is a prob it's a problem program. Because remember, the yeah. machines think in programs. Mm. Yes. Mm. And this program that's called human yes. mm. has got flaws. Precisely. And it's actually yeah. defective. It makes irrational decisions. Mm. That's it. It gets emotional. Mm. So That's it needs it. to be deleted. Yeah. yeah. And so, then, so if, if, if you humans, take humans are Springbok rugby players, <laughs> <laughs> make so, bad decisions. So. Yeah. Uh, and if, if if you take uh, some of the intelligence that is now being built into cars, where you can literally drive a car, but you know the algorithm in the car can start to realize that you're not driving in a more efficient way, and it takes. Yeah. Probably yeah. the biggest proponents yeah. of not letting not letting AIs make the To get to decision. that point, yeah. And, and that just means that the, the system has to have ground rules built into Absolutely. it, which yeah. is don't kill the humans. Well, you've got hackers at the moment, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. you can imagine what yeah. these guys can do. It's, it's a point of view. Yeah. 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 Google, Google currently is mm. having teams mm. of people that main job is just to develop kill switches mm. so that if the machine goes ballistic yeah. because remember we're talking in our realm about self-driving cars and the toaster mm. yep. in other environments it's a drone that has a payload mm. of that can yeah. destroy mm. thousands of people <laughs> so when, yeah. when machines mm. go haywire and they are spending millions mm. on, on trying to develop kill switches precisely because of the self thinking yeah. mm -hmm. and self learning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. because it's actually not thinking, it's, it's executing. Yeah. There's yeah. no emotion. Yeah. Come on, I know you wanted to say something. I'm going to let Kamal come in. There's a case to be made for AI okay. and Twisted, right? Yeah. Uh, I like the AI. That's a little facetious, yeah. but like, whoever gets the yeah. toast the way they want it, yeah. right? like, like you know, this is a Machine real problem for toast. humanity. <laughs> come on, please, yes. go. I actually wanted to, somebody asked a question around digital literacy, and I think that's yeah. a, it's, it's a powerful point. Because, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, yeah, I said, yeah. Mm. yeah uh, um, um, and, and I think it touches on AI also being interpreted as augmented intelligence. Mm. Uh, yes. And that's a big deal for me, because the, the type of examples we're talking about here, and the, and, and the potential future for mm. humanity is about coexistence and leveraging the uh, being able to, to use technology in a, in a, in a, in a cohabited way. Mm. It's not one or the other. Yeah. And the digital literacy, the longer term digital literacy, mm. apart from knowing where the off button is when an algorithm goes wrong, mm. uh, is about how to do that. And, and what are the skills we mm. are going to need to build for ourselves and the future generations to be able to, uh, to, to, to harness the power of technology as opposed to opposing it. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, yeah, can I, I add something to that? Yeah, um, you need to wrap up, but um, quickly, if I please, yeah. And just particularly in the South African context, um, we have to think about um, building digital literacy into our education systems. Uh, I mean, where you're sitting currently with rural schools where people have one classroom, are learning grades one, two, and three, sitting in the same classroom as each other. How do you take those people to a point where they can be digitally literate uh, to be able to function in this world uh, where, it, where it's a core requirement. Yeah. Uh, and, and we need to think very hard government 
uh, needs to think very hard, but they can't do everything. Um, uh, we need to find ways uh, to be able to bring people to the point where technology is available to everyone, uh, no matter where you're from. I mean, I, th I think we need to apply that. I agree with you. We need to apply that to the education system itself. Absolutely. You know, the education system was designed in the early 1900s to give factory employees just enough education not to run their fingers through a sewing machine and to read instructions. Like, we need to, we need to seriously rethink how we educate ourselves, you know. How do we, how do we educate our youth? I mean, we... Africa, the biggest change in Africa, according to the great Hans Rosling, the mm -hmm. statistician, was, is that in the, in the next uh, 80 years or so, Africa's population is going to go from the current 1.1 billion to 4 billion. Mm -hmm. we, we are, we are going to have billions of people who need to be educated in a way that is meaningful for the future of the world. You know, and that's yeah. and that's that's what I think we should be spending our time worrying but, about. Like, yeah. if we worry about education yeah. in the same way that we should be worrying about water, yeah. you yeah. know, and not worrying about how ESCOM is going to, you know, bring yeah. the economy down, yeah. that that would be a much better use of our time and capacity because our yeah. kids need to be educated in a way that's going to sure. make them give them an education and make them functional in a world where so, maybe you won't yeah. have to drive a car. I think that we are going to unfortunately have to, to wrap up and uh, um, quick quick note, uh, uh, Bongani. Yeah, no, I, I think I just wanted yeah. to, to add on, on what you were saying. I think the biggest question is uh, what will be the role of government going forward? Mm. Because if you look at all these technological advancement, mm. uh, government is actually less involved. Mm. You look at Uber, Airbnb, and whatever, right? Mm. You, you, can, you can go into different verticals. Mm. But the, the point is, when you talk about education, how much would that responsibility be of, for government? Uh, because I think the issues that they are just sitting there to formulate policies, to cap certain things not to happen or to happen. So how much of government will actually play in this role to actually advance education? Thank you for that. And, and there, there have been a couple of questions actually around what is what is government doing? Are, are they yeah. ready for this? And so forth. And I think that maybe it's a topic <laughs> we, that we can do we have take to take that? Do we have to for, answer that uh, seriously? <laughs> another, another discussion as well. I think that's, that's, that's really important. But I think there are a lot of lessons that we've taken away from tonight. One lesson that I take away, and I think because we are in an educational setup, we are at the university, mm -hmm. And, and we're trying to furnish the base around, you know, how to grapple with these things. I think the education question is hugely uh, important. And we, we often talk about the four C's, you know, communication, yeah. collaborations, critical thinking, and, and uh, skills that are sort of, you know, also have an idea that comes back then to uh, all of these very kind of, you know, quite... Uh, debates that are, you know, that's going to shape our future going forward. And I think that, that creative and critical thinking is very important and communications and collaborations, you know, are going to be uh, hugely important for us. So thank you very, very, very much for your engagements tonight. And I think it's been absolutely fascinating. And I think there's uh, much more to say on the topic. And we are going to have another cloud debate on the 30th of October. And then we're going to talk about what is it, you know, what does it mean and what are the challenges of raising children in Industry 4.0 and, and the teenagers sitting at home, the London tube for the, you know, these are some of the discussions that will come up then. But for now, I want to say thank you for, for those of you who have participated online and from wherever you've been, at home, at the office or in the car or on the tube maybe in London <laughs> or somewhere else in, in the world. But thank you, Toby, Nicola, Bungani, Kamal, Oscar, Babu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.